frigid Alaskan waters proved treacherous across the state. Something bad happened and they got stuck in a bad situation. In Kodiak, the Coast Guard must find a way to reach a surfer ripped away from shore. That cliff is pretty high. I don't even know if we have enough cable to reach him. You kind of get the pucker factor going. 200 feet of cable with high winds. It's extremely dangerous. While in Sitka, waves punish small vessels. And I look back out the door, and the boat is now out of my uh, frame of view. Where's the friggin' boat go? Where's the boat? Can't find the boat. Do a 360 sweep to find me the boat, please. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, 350 highly trained men and women risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. Did you get some good ones? Yeah. Yeah? You cold? <laughs> My name is Jason McGrath. I'm an aviation survival technician or helicopter rescue swimmer, as most people know it as. This is uh, Bear Paw Beach. I try to get out here three or four times a week, depending on the swell. So I work nights, which makes it nice, because I can get out here in the morning and, and then just go straight to work. Right now, it's uh, low tide, so it's, it's kind of closing out everywhere. So it's just trying to find where there's a good shoulder and peak to play on. Let's have fun. Man, when I first got out there, I'd try, try, I'd be right at the lip, and then it would just be a free fall, like right to the bottom. Yeah, this is definitely a good day compared to what we've seen lately. Being a rescue swimmer, I think it attracts that type of personality that it seeks adrenaline type sports to relax you. Surfing definitely helps keep you sharp. You're able to think fast, definitely helps with the job. You know, we've got to be able to make quick decisions out there. I'm definitely glad there's waves up here. Keep me sane while I'm here. My name is Lieutenant Jake Smith. I'm a search and rescue pilot. Uh, fly the 60s out of Kodiak. We heard the alarm go off right around 11:30. The uh, surfer was stuck off Fossil Beach. Uh, was unable to get back into shore. The weather wasn't that great here at the station. Just over a mile of visibility with freezing rain and uh, low ceilings, uh, with high winds expected offshore. Ready for it. Ready up. It's going on two, one, two. Sector Anchorage, Sector Anchorage, Coast Guard Rescue 6005, Coast Guard Rescue 6005. We are airborne at this time, in route for SAR. Roger, just the one surfer, he's sort of trapped on a rock in between Fossil Beach and the Grand Station. Uh, he's an experienced surfer. We don't know if he's hurt or not, but he's probably tired. We made it feet wet. We were pretty much in the goo, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, we received word that he was actually on the rocks. With bigger surf pounding on the rocks, uh, you know, we might be looking at broken bones if he's up on the shore. But it also could mean that he made it up there safely and is in a safe position at that time. So we'll be uh, in between the narrow cape and the Ugak. Those waves are moving out there today. Holy cow. We got 49. Thanks. I'm off for going surfing, but if it's 20 footers out like this, then it's nasty. Yeah, I think they said the water temp is 38 degrees. Yeah. So hopefully this guy's got a dry suit on. Yeah. We got down on scene, made contact with the ground party at Fossil Beach. There's other surfers down there, actually from the Coast Guard. They did have a drop radio, and they vectored us in uh, to the general area. And Roger, good copy. We'll go ahead and mark that position. My name is Jason McGrath. I'm an aviation survival technician. 
rescue swimmer. I jumped on the radio and told them, you know, to start looking right there, and, and the current was pushing, you know, from the east to the west. It was pretty challenging search conditions with the big surf, the high winds, real gusty winds where they were trying to, you know, get into a hover and, and look for them. So I, I knew time was crucial for, for everybody. So we're, we're in vicinity of uh, where they were reporting. Roger, cabin door's coming open. I'm going to go ahead and climb up a little bit so we can orbit. Um, Lieutenant Mike Gronke, H-60 search and rescue pilot at Air Station Kodiak. When we got on scene, of course, we looked in the surf zone. No sign of him. He might be down here someplace, guys, just below us. He might be getting beat up against the cliff pretty bad then. I don't see any other rocks out here. I don't either. Tie IR there, Ralph. Might be able to get his e-signature off the side of the cliff there. Rock that, sir. Luckily, our aircraft's equipped with infrared uh, capability, and the rescue swimmer in the back, Ralphie, was on the infrared camera. So they were saying up here at about the 11 o'clock now, about another 300 yards is a, uh, a cliff that comes out a little bit. They were saying he was just on the other side of that. I got, I got him at uh, about 7 o'clock. He's uh, up on the cliff pretty high. He's waving at the uh, IR right now. All right. Oh, I, I see him. I got him in sight. I got him in sight. Yep. It looks like he's trying to climb. He's about 50 feet up the cliff, and there's about another 150 feet above him. Pretty good overhang, too. Wow, dude. What are you guys thinking? <laughs> that's, that's a tricky one. Oh, man. That cliff is pretty high. We, I don't even know if we have enough cable to reach him if we yeah. went straight down, right? That, yeah, that's, it'd, really be, it'd be really tough. The further down the cable goes, the harder it's going to be to keep control of the basket. So, all right. So it'll probably be about a 200-foot uh, hoist uh, if we were to hoist them from off the cliff. I'm Joshua Schaefer. I'm a aviation maintenance technician for the United States Coast Guard. You know, as we got on scene, the winds were pretty high, and we got into a hover to the area that we wanted to hoist this guy out of. Just call me, um, Josh, whatever you think. Yeah, sir, easy forwarding, right? Clear my tail if you would, too, please. Yeah, your, your tail's, you got yeah. plenty of room, man. This, this would be, it's, pretty it's definitely right doable. We were about 260 feet down to the water. From where that uh, guy was standing, we were 30 feet above the cliff, and he was uh, about halfway up that, so it had to have been at least uh, 200 feet that we uh, had to pay out to get the basket to the survivor. With the wind, sir, I'm worried about the basket bouncing around oh. and knocking him into the water. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. He's on a pretty flat piece of uh, land right there. I can get the basket straight down to him. Um, OK. We usually hoist between 30 and 40 feet. Uh, it's easier to manage the cable at that point. It's easier for the flight mech in the back. It's easier for the pilot. This was a little bit different. It's extremely dangerous. You kind of get the pucker factor going, especially when we're talking about 200 feet of cable with high winds and turbulence coming off the cliff. It becomes a, a, a very big risk for everyone involved. I don't want to put Ralphie at risk if we don't have to. If we could just get a basket down to him. Just give it a shot. All right, uh, hoist power set to all. Hoist is set to all. You feel as though the winds are going to blow that thing into a cliff? Wave it off, you know? And uh, we'll try something else. Basket's going down. And survivor's at the 10 o'clock low, about 200 yards forward. Basket's going down. Basket's about halfway down. This is good, hold. Easy forward. Easy forward and left, hold. This is one of the most difficult hoists that I've done so far, just due to the height. I had to fight the, the cable a lot. I had to fight the basket. I had to try to, to get it to where I needed it to be, even though the wind wanted to take it the other way. Hold, 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 hold. He's on a pretty flat piece of land right there. I can get the basket straight down to him. The alarm went off about 11.30. For a surfer in distress, uh, Fossil Beach, everybody in Kodiak's pretty familiar with Fossil Beach. It's a local hangout. So we put a move on, got airborne. When we did finally locate the survivor, he was indeed on a, a cliff, probably about 50 feet above the waterline, and then the top of the cliff was at least another 100 feet above him. So it was, it was pretty high. So ultimately, we decided to just lower the basket. Basket's going down. Basket's about halfway down. This is good, hold. 
is probably one of the more dangerous hoists I think I've ever seen. You know, you're trying to get a basket onto a cliff that's probably three by three uh, from 200 feet up. It's, uh, it's pretty challenging. Hold, 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 hold. Looking good, sir. Are you too far on the left? Good. Just fighting the turbulence a little bit, so. That's fine. I I've almost got it, too. Hold. Survivor's getting in the basket. Prepare to take the load, taking the load. Easy forward and right. Clear right. And right, right, right. Survivor's clear the rocks, and survivor's going out over the water. You can start coming easy down, so we close the gap between the helo and the water. When ready, sir. Okay. You know, after we got out over the water, we started reeling in that 200 feet. Once we finally got it up, you know, I, I could see his face as he got closer to the aircraft, and he was, he was pretty happy. You know, he's giving thumbs up. He's giving a little surfer sign. You know, he's ready to go home. <laughs> Survivor's coming up. Roger. We're gonna hold here. Bring the survivor inside the cabin. Survivor's inside the cabin. Always complete. Nice job, Scott. All right, rest check to part three. Yeah, Roger, sir. Once we got him inside, he was grinning near to ear. Uh, he seemed to be in really good spirits and glad to be off the cliffside. Got him some water, you know, got him on ICS and talked to him a little bit. Hey, thanks, fellas. Man, no problem, man. Yeah. Yeah, I was out there, and the, out, of, out of nowhere, the wind just picked up. Like, out of nowhere. And it pushed me into that corner, and I was like, well, I can wait for the wind to back down and, and just climb up here. I, was, I thought that I was in a good spot to climb all the way up, but then I got over there, and I'm like, dude, I'm stuck out Holy here. Holy smokes. <laughs> Did you uh, impact any of the rocks at all, or? Yeah, I think that my board a little bit, but I'm good. My name is Scott Jones. I've been surfing in Alaska for 13 years now. I never had any problems. I've been in situations before, but nothing like this. The wind started turning, and I let the rip take me down to the rocks, and I'm thinking, oh, I'll just wait for the squall to go through, which is what I thought it was, just a real quick wind squall. Well, the wind just kept getting stronger. And, uh, that rip and the wind now caught me and pushed me even further down. I got around the corner and finally just uh, climbed up a rock wall and said, you know, I'm stuck here until someone comes and gets me because I can't scale 200 feet in a wetsuit and, uh, and I can't paddle back to the beach. That uh, flare cap will work really good. It's tough to see him in a black wetsuit on the, uh, on the cliff. Yeah, it yeah, yeah exactly what it was, too. You guys use IR to spot me? Yep, that's cool. Have you showed up as a big old white dot in a, in a background of black? I was like, yeah, he found it. He's like, there he is. <laughs> I would have been hypothermic for sure if they hadn't came and got me when they did. Uh, I was fine, but another hour or two, I don't know if I would have been able to get out of there. This particular mission is the exact kind of mission we like. It's quick, successful, and everybody returned safely in some challenging conditions that, that was interesting. Makes for a good case. Good. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, man. <laughs> now, you know what? You couldn't end up in a better spot. Oh, I know. That's exactly why I did that. I climbed up that area. I looked at the, I was like, I can't climb out of here, but I might as well. That was, yeah, that was yeah. the best spot you could have been standing. Yeah. So that was awesome. Good job on your part. So, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> cool. You know, ultimately, this was a very good, successful mission. I've got a big head now. <laughs> I, that was the, my highest hoist ever, and, and I, it was done really fast, really, really professionally, and I, I'm very happy about it. I'm an aviation maintenance technician, third class, Joshua Schaefer. I brought my family over to the uh, Marine Science Institute. They do a lot of research out here, and they also have a touch tank. It's pretty cool. He's like, oh, yeah, he's getting the sleeves rolled up. He's ready to go. You want to do the touch tank? Awesome, Look at that guy. Cool looking grab. Look at him. He's really Look, where's bumpy. He not gonna picture? He's not going to picture, is he? <laughs> I didn't know you were touching right there. He's not going to hurt you. There you go. He's just bulky. Good job. Oh, it's so cold. This is one of the only things, you know, on a rainy day, on a nasty, snowy, windy day, to just, like, get out of the house and come take your kids to do. A Kermit crab. Yes. A Kermit crab? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <all that. laughs> Look at that. This thing's creeping out. Whoa, dude. He's slimy. I know. 
That's like a big daddy one. I love being a father. He's an awesome kid. He, he looks like me, you know? His personality is just like me. He loves sciencey stuff, just like I was when I was that age. I love to see the look on his face. I just seen a movie. Yeah, that's cool. See the scallop? Is that, is that a sponge? Yep, sponge is overtaking the scallop. It lives it's on like top SpongeBob. Of the scallop. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, SpongeBob cool. is a sponge. Yeah, this one's gooey. Cool. So living here on this small island, a uh, small community, it's pretty cool they have this research facility here for us to come and look at the marine life. It's a really neat little thing for the kids and they enjoy it. Oh, look at this big one, look at this big one. You want to touch, you want to put your hand around him? Oh, my God. Grab him, grab him like, oh. hey, oh, he's got you. He's got you. <laughs> I don't want him to eat my hand up. He no, he's not eat your hand. <laughs> I am very, very proud of my husband. Like, I can't explain how proud I am of him. Like, he's amazing what he does. All we had was two men in a 15-foot skiff uh, that was taking on water. We were all on edge, knowing that we were losing daylight. I want to off the boat. Why would you come out in a boat like that today? <laughs> My name is Dan McDevitt. I'm a aviation maintenance technician, third class petty officer here at Air Station Sitka. We ended up getting the call uh, right around one o'clock, I, I want to say, maybe a little bit before. And uh, we went up to the op center, listened in on the radio. And then uh, once our pilot gave us the official word that we were launching, we went down and changed out. <laughs> My name is Chris Belisle. I'm an AST2 in the United States Coast Guard near Station Sitka. All we had was uh, two men in a 15-foot uh, skiff uh, that was taking on water uh, offshore uh, outside of uh, Bjorka Island. Our transit time to the, the gentleman was approximately 20 minutes. The first thing we were doing is we were grabbing survival suits and uh, hypothermic bags, which are sleeping bags that we put people that are really cold, and it helps bring up their core temperature. They kept saying that they were sinking, they were taking on water, and all we were trying to do is just get to them. All right, we're ready to go. Visibly, it was just over a half mile when we launched. Snow squalls were moving through the area, so we knew that we would encounter this in and out of the flight. And without having a, an exact position for the vessel, we didn't know if we were going to be in or out of those snow squalls until we were actually out there. There's a needle again. Report right back to the left. Heading direct to that position. We didn't know their exact location, and they didn't know it either. The only navigation they had on board was a compass. So we were using the direction finder that we have on the helicopter, and uh, we kept having them do a countdown, and the direction finder would pick up their radio signal and uh, point us in the right direction. Crummy weather out here. It's hard to see. We were facing, uh, I believe, 20 knot to 30 knot winds. Uh, snow, it was snowing very heavy. It was, it was bumpy. Roger that, sir. We're on our way to you right now. We were all on edge going into this one, knowing that, uh, that we're losing daylight. And uh, once we lose daylight, we increase our chances of not finding the person. Cease route for the Coast Guard to UCS. Yes, I did. Hey, I'm visual. Hey, the boat, two o'clock. I'm inside. The uh, pilots up front were able to spot them first. Tell them we're going to put the swimmer in. Why would you come out in a boat like that today? You know, they're probably trying to run it on the shore and then uh, lost sight of land and got turned around. And, yeah. We circled and did an assessment of their vessel. He's taking water right over to stern now. And they were running with the seas, and, and actually, they thought they were heading towards town, but actually, they were heading further offshore. And they were about 28 miles from shore when they thought they were about six miles from shore. We are, sir, stand by one. Summer's ready. Due to their proximity to land, there was no way to get the boat to land and try to save the boat. So our concern was getting the people off. We're going to send a rescue swimmer down. Swimmer. Right. Swimmer's in the water. And the swimmer swam over to the boat. And we had to make sure to keep enough distance from the boat due to the fact that we didn't want to blow them over with our rotor wash. 
So he had a little bit of a swim to get over the boat to get the first guy in the water. He's almost to him. So when I first made contact with the boat, I immediately got up into it, kind of assessed the situation, see what was going on. Immediately noticed that the water was almost up to the edge of the freeboard. I sat into it, see if I could talk to them. Well, that boat's going over. Yep. And immediately the boat started rolling, so I hopped off immediately before I threw everybody overboard. Uh, right about then, that's when uh, EJ, the bigger of the two, really wanted to get off. Ready for pickup. Ready for pickup. Uh, master plan, 40 feet recovery of the survivor. Master plan, somebody down. I got a hold of them, put them into our basket, which is what we always put our survivors in. It makes them feel safer. Uh, EJ was relatively big for this. Took me a little bit getting him in. Full position, take it load. Position, clear water. Where's the friggin' boat go? Basket's just below the cabin. Where's the boat? Can't find the boat. Do a 360 sweep to find me the boat, please. The boat that we're out is a 15-foot skiff, which was definitely a small boat to be out in the 6 to 8 to occasional 10-foot seas that they were operating in. They also had taken a good bit of water into the boat, so we knew, obviously, that their situation was, uh, was not good and we needed to recover them uh, fairly soon because we're pretty sure that boat was going to go over, you know, at any minute. Ready for pickup. Ready for pickup. Uh, master plan, 40 feet recovery of the survivor. Master plan, somebody down. I got a hold of them, put them into our basket, which is what we always put our survivors in. It makes them feel safer. Uh, EJ was relatively big for this. Took me a little bit getting him in. Full position, take it load. Position, clear the water. Where's the friggin' boat go? Basket's just below the cabin. Where's the boat? Can't find the boat. Do a 360 sweep to find me the boat, please. After I get the first guy off, I, I turn my, you know, I, I get them in the cabin and I have my eyes in the cabin and get them out and into the troop seat. And then I look back out the door and the boat is now out of my uh, frame of view. And I look down and I see Chris, the swimmer, still in the water. So we end up picking Chris back up. Looking for the boat. I do not see the boat. Oh, Chris. There it is. All right, we're going to have to pick him up. He's four. He's four. He's four. He's four. He's four. I'm fine, the boat's fine, I'm just right. going to get back home. So, uh, point me in the right direction. I'm going to go find him. He's forward, Roger. Stand by. Pressure's going to clear the water. He wants to go home on the boat. He wants us to point him in the right direction, and he wants to... Did you say that? Yeah. The guy still on the boat was trying to make it back to, you know, the island, because uh, he didn't want to, obviously, uh, wreck his boat or lose his boat. The guy on the boat's a diabetic one. His name's Adam. I spoke with him on the radio and told him, though, he needed to get off the vessel. We were about an hour away from sunset, and uh, there was no way that we were going to be able to vector him through the night. Uh, the vessel had no lights, uh, and, and the sea state was not uh, conducive to the vessel, and plus the vessel still was taken on water. Two Sprout, uh, give you a heads up, Cap. You are 25 miles outside of town. Okay, so I need to go north. No, you need to go west. These waves are really messing me up. Yeah, Roger, Cap. I'm going to recommend we take you off the boat. So we encouraged him. He needed to get off the vessel. While we were doing this, Sitka being such a small town and being a maritime town, uh, a lot of people have VHF radios in their vehicles in their houses. Uh, and we found out later that uh, essentially a good portion of the town was listening to the SAR case unfold. And while I was trying to encourage the owner to get off the vessel, his grandfather actually gets on the radio. Adam, this is Pop. Leave the boat. It's Dad's out there. Where's the boat going to float you on? Japan. Don't worry about it, Adam. You guys just come home. Uh, I don't want to. I know, okay. Coast Guard, here I come. The skipper, the final guy still on board, was, uh, was diabetic. And it had been quite a few hours since he had eaten last, and he threw up. So uh, he wasn't in a full state of mind, I guess you could say. He was definitely getting a little delirious, and hence him trying to think he can make it back to land. Summer's ready. Can't begin the hoist. And there it goes. Both yep, boat there on. There you go. Yep, yep. Oh. All right. Oh. He's up. He's, he's up. 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 OK. OK. Summer's on his way down. So they immediately lowered me down to the water. The good thing, uh, Adam was smart and climbed on top of the boat, so he was at least up and out of the water. Immediately swam over to him, made contact. 
sector. Be advised, uh, one survivor on board, second survivor we're getting them right now. Boat just capsized. Survivor is accounted for, swimmer is on scene with them. Roger. I get a hold of them, I kind of brief them about what's going to happen. I just signal for the helicopter to bring the basket, lower the basket, and I put them in. Take it alone. A couple minutes later, they were hoisting me up, and then we were on our way home. And Sector Juno, we have both survivors on board. If you could notify uh, Sika EMS so that uh, we can have them on the ramp waiting uh, to check these guys out. Roger, copy. My name is Adam Howard, and I've lived here in Sitka for my whole life. My family's lived here in Sitka for about 300 years or 16 generations, and I absolutely love it here. We were attempting to go hunting on Mount Edgecombe Island. When we got there, it wasn't that bad of weather, and on the way back, we decided that it was kind of getting a little too ugly for us, and it ended up uh, fogging down, snowing, Hailing, it was everything. There's our ambulance. Hail is on deck. This is what Alaska is about, really extreme. Sometimes it's real pretty, and sometimes it's a beast. It's a monster. And this time, um, it ended up biting us. The Coast Guard, I'm very thankful for them for dropping everything that they're doing and just trying to help us out. And the whole community of Sitka is really unique because we will all pull together in a traumatic experience. and. Uh, be there for each other. I think overall these, these two gentlemen are very lucky to be alive. The direction they were going and the weather they were going and the boat that they were with, yeah, they were very lucky to be alive. David Call here in Kodiak, Alaska. I work for the Coast Guard. I'm a corpsman. Um, I also fly, do medevacs. Today is our off day, so we're going to do some mountain biking. Yeah, we'll go down. Ride down the fast track. Ooh, ooh. Hey, uh, Showing that one pack. Showing off some skin. It's got a keg, yeah, exactly. I'm down. All right. Rock and roll. Let's do it. First, we're going to go down the ex-boyfriend trail. It's more of a dirt trail. It's going down the face of the mountain. It's a nice view because you can look out and you can see all of Kodiak. If I do get hurt or somebody else does get hurt, uh, both myself and Trice have medical experience and uh, we always carry something in our bags. You know what, what happened to you, by the way? Wardrobe malfunction. It's just making you look rugged. It'll work, maybe. Oh, come on now. E tape? Oh, yeah, that'll work. E tape fixes everything. Didn't die on that yeah, one, guys. Buddy. Didn't die. We got 4.1 miles for the day. Nice. Max speed 24.9. Nice. So I guess let's pack it up. Get yeah, out of here. It's always nice to get some rest and then be able to do something like this outside. It also keeps me in shape and it's fun. Got my keys? What? Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't even joke. Right. Nailed it. <laughs> After a bad case, if there is severe trauma, it's always good to do something to keep your mind off of it and make you forget. Mountain biking, you can't really be thinking about something else. So it's definitely a good way to forget about the trauma or the severity of the case. I got a call that we had a medevac for a possible blood clot in the leg. Get her done. It's going to be a late night, a long late night. Heard a call come over the radio. There was a vessel that was dead in the water. It had no power anymore, and it was just drifting. I hope their anchor caught. Otherwise, they may be on shore by now, just broken into pieces.
I'm David Call. I'm an HS3 in Kodiak, Alaska, so I'm a corpsman. I got a call that we had a medevac for a possible blood clot in the leg. The biggest fear is for that blood clot to either go to the heart, which is going to cause a heart attack clot in the heart where blood is not being perfused to the limbs, or it's going to go to the brain and cause a stroke. We got the call, and it was time to go. Get her done. It's going to be a late night, a long late night. They told us that there was a man who was experiencing loss of feeling in one of his legs. He had a history of uh, embolisms, uh, in which, in a previous case, he had actually lost his other leg. They had to amputate it. So they were quite concerned that he was having the same issue, and they wanted to try and get him to medical uh, facilities in Anchorage as soon as possible so he wouldn't lose his other leg. We loaded up in the aircraft, got everything we needed, and headed towards Dutch Harbor. It's about a five and a half hour flight from Kodiak. Flight surgeon is recommending medevac, and they were talking about a six hour window as like the ideal time frame. We'll be close to, to making that, but obviously, sooner the better. Once we got on scene, we saw the ambulance there waiting for us. We pulled off onto the ramp, and the rescue swimmer and the corpsman that we had aboard got out of the aircraft and went and met the ambulance. Got out, picked up the patient. He was stable. He wasn't in severe pain at that time. I checked the leg out, and if it was going to go into a higher level of pain, I was prepared to give him morphine. After a couple minutes, they finally got the person out of the ambulance, transferred him to the aircraft. After we did that and got him sitting in a seat in the aircraft, we ended up taxiing out, took off out of Dutch Harbor, and headed back east towards Cold Bay. All I the sector was so They're going to have EMS feed us at the guard hangar. Roger. Once he got in the aircraft, we stabilized him, got him secure. We took a set of vitals to make sure he was stable. I just did pretty much monitoring of care. Sector, we're down to clear. Off with the passenger. Roger. All right, guys, um, I'm assuming they'll come up when you start walking out. Yep. All right, well, let's transfer you over to the medevac company. We dropped the passenger off to the Guardian flight, which was a fixed-wing aircraft <clears throat> that was waiting on deck for us with medical services on board. And they took off out of Cold Bay and headed back east. All right, well, good luck. You guys have a safe flight. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. It's always a good feeling to know that I've helped somebody and that I've provided a, a care that somebody else might not have been able to. I love to fly, and I love helping people, so I get to do both of them in my job here in Kodiak. It's definitely always nice to know that I am doing some kind of good, and I'll keep doing that as long as I can. I'm David Call. I'm an HS3 in Kodiak, Alaska. I also get to work with the fire department. Tonight we did a live fire drill. It involved Bayside Volunteer Fire Station and Woman's Bay. It's good training to trade with the other fire departments in case there is some type of mass disaster so we all know how to work together. Here at Bayside Volunteer Fire Department, we put together the most intricate drill that we've ever had here. We have state troopers, we have charter boat operators, and we have quite a few Coast Guard volunteers here also. They bring a lot of skills for EMS purposes. A lot of them are already trained firefighters, so we blend pretty well together. It's always good to be well-rounded. I not only know how to save people that are in cold water, but I know how to save people that are in hot, burning buildings. Over here. Over here. 
Coast Guard folks bring in all kinds of special skills. David Call, EMT, flight medic, he brings a lot to us, helps out with training. That's the Coast Guard. They're a great asset to have out there. Coast Guard and Kodiak kind of go hand in hand. And I think it's good to give back to the community you're in as much as possible. Kodiak is an island, so there is only so many people that can help you out. So everybody kind of has to be prepared to help out their neighbor or somebody they see on the side of the road. The more often I train, the better prepared I will be to help anybody, either on the Coast Guard base or out here to respond to an EMS or a fire call. This is kind of me trying to give back to the community a little bit. When we first got on scene, it looked very rough to me. The boat was bobbing around quite a bit. It wasn't comfortable for them. It was obvious to see that. The vessel was drifting towards shore, so are they just going to be bashed against the rocks, or do, are these people going to have a chance to get out? Now put the ready helo online. Now put the ready helo online. We have a 24 foot cabin vessel in distress in the vicinity of Whitestone Harbor. Now put the ready helo online. Now put the ready helo online. I'm Lieutenant David Berkey, stationed at Air Station Sitka. I'm one of the pilots. I was upstairs in the operations center, pretty much getting ready to go to bed, and I heard a call come over the radio that there was a vessel that was dead in the water. It had no power anymore, and it was just drifting. Two people aboard. That's about 80 miles north of here. The winds had picked up up there, and uh, seas were pretty rough. And they were going to send a Coast Guard cutter from Sector Juno, but it was going to take three hours to get on scene. So they wanted us also to get airborne and uh, see if we could assist the Mariner. Well, we were on our way there. We've got a really stiff headwind. This 35 knots that we're going against, this is really dramatically increasing the amount of time it's taken us to get there. I hope their anchor caught. Otherwise, they may be on shore by now, just broken into pieces. With all due respect to the people out there tonight, I don't understand why you would be out there. Alaskans, they know the conditions. They know the survival odds. They know what they're getting into. So. Something bad happened and they got stuck in a bad situation. When we first got on scene, it looked very rough to me. The boat was bobbing around quite a bit four to five foot swells at least with a chop on top of that and 30 to 35 knot winds. It wasn't comfortable for them. It was obvious to see that. And uh, we heard the vessel in distress talking to commercial fishing vessel. Uh, Lincoln, Blue, Jim, Queen, you me up on this one. Merger, Queen, you know where we're at. That helicopter We turn on the uh, track of beam and we're going to put it on the boat, see if we can't help that commercial vessel in route. Roger that, sir. Spotlight that we have on the MA-60T is called a track of beam If we point it out in direction of the water or the boat, we can light up everything around it. And tonight, we were, we were using that to help the commercial vessel, because they couldn't see the smaller vessel just off the shoreline. So we were able to provide them a good position and then vector them in towards the vessel. OK, Roger, we can see you. So we're heading that way. Back about clean. Coast Guard helicopter, once you get there, uh, are you all set up to be able to tow them back to port? Yeah, Roger. We're getting a tow line ready now. My name's Bill Veeler. I live here in Huna, Alaska. I've lived here pretty much most of my life. Maybe two, three times a year we have something like this happen here. So we just went and we didn't check the weather before we went or we might have thought twice. <laughs> all right, I want to take a look at this vagabond queen. Put that boat up on the floor, sir, if you want to look at it. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks good. Yeah, he doesn't look like he's having a lot of fun. Okay, we got a big line. We'll swing in there by you. Okay, I'll make my way up to the bow and get ready to receive the line. Okay, sounds good. That's the guy right here getting that tow line ready. The boat that came out to tow this guy tonight was a commercial fishing boat. 
in a situation like that, where the nearest Coast Guard asset that can actually do anything is still hours away, obviously we're going to take the best thing we've got. He was the best thing we had at the time. He was willing to do it. He was able to do it. So all the pieces fell in place tonight. When we were coming in, they were kind of in the surf, more or less. They were in so close that I wasn't going to be able to swing around and come in behind them and throw a line. I was going to have to trough it in and then turn hard and get them line. And when we were on our way in, we, you know, we started bottoming out on the grass, so it got pretty hairy. Right, you got a big line to the guy. Hopefully you can get it on here. Hey, Noel, if one of these guys goes in the water, how long will it take you to get ready? About two minutes. Okay. They're underway. My name is Thomas Mills. I'm a native. I'm born and raised in Excursion Unit, just northwest of here. I was going down to Lynn Canal. And when we got out there by the island, the waves stacked up on us and we couldn't turn back. So we hear a high pitched squeal, and pretty soon the bilge water caught into that fuel and uh, killed the engine. Sector, we advise the vessel is in tow. We seem to be doing uh, just fine right now. We are RTV at this time. Out. All of us involved, we fished all over Alaska. We've rescued people, and I think this is the second time in my life that I've been rescued. There you go, Alaska's still for Alaska, right there. If there's a distress call, we as the Coast Guard almost have to race to beat Good Samaritans there, because as soon as the call goes out, people just flock to the area to try to help, to do whatever they can. Everybody knows, hey, we're in this together. For approach. Make your approach, next. Kind of relief to know the Coast Guard was there in case we got in trouble. My father was in the Coast Guard and he died in a boating accident trying to save someone when I was five years old. And that kind of motivates me a lot on everything that I do. Alaska, I think, has got a pretty good understanding of the Coast Guard, where we're at, and what we can do for them. You know, the villages and the commercial fishing vessels know what we're here for, to offer safety for them and assistance if needed. And uh, I think that's very much appreciated. The Coast Guard is the first and last resort and hope for someone's life. We are whatever you want it to be, whenever you need it, when nobody else can do it. And nowhere is that demonstrated more than up here in Alaska.